Good evening and welcome to the servers here tonight. We're delighted here in St Paul's to welcome those from St Andrew's Trinity, from Howwood and Johnston High. We meet here this night to remember the day our Lord Jesus Christ was beaten, betrayed and crucified. We meet as the darkness falls in our sorrow and pain, seeking that glimmer of light that tells us it was not in vain. We sing the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, 392, When I Survey. Let us pray. Words are hard to find on this day. For what words can measure the height, depth and breadth of your love as shown to us as we gaze upon the cross of Christ? Words cannot express our sense of bewilderment nor words explain the mystery of the cross. Words cannot demonstrate our sense of gratitude, knowing that it was for us that he suffered there. Words alone cannot confess our deepest sins as we realise it was hands like ours that nailed him there, lips like ours that mocked and derided him, our sins, our failures, our compromises, our failings, which he bore. So as we hear again of that awful day, let us be filled with such awe and wonder. Let us once again stand and gaze. Then may we drop to our knees and offer you our souls, our lives, our all, to Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to read some selected verses from John chapter 18 and 19. 
when he had finished praying. Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who had betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing that all was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him on the face. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Near the cross, Jesus stood, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plants, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Amen. May God bless unto us this reading of his own most holy word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Our hymn is 549, How Deep the Father's Love.
the Celts had a saying that heaven and earth are only three feet apart, but in the thin places, it is even closer. So George MacLeod spoke of Iona. When the veil is lifted and you catch a glimpse of the glory of God. But I have also come to know of thin veils between earth and hell. I've been to places where you touched evil and glimpsed the very depths to which humanity can sink. And we can name these places. For me, it was the genocide in Srebrenica. Or we can talk of Auschwitz, or Belsen, Cambodia, Darfur, and tonight, Golgotha. And so we could go on. But one place in my experience captured both experiences, both earth and heaven, and heaven and hell, the depths of hell and the glory of heaven, the evil to which humanity can sink, and the wondrous love of God. It happened trip to Princeton, just a few months after 9-11. A group of us from Scotland skipped classes and took the train into New York City, visiting the usual tourist spots, ending up with the twilight setting sun, looking down on the vast crater that was 9-11. Nothing could have prepared us for that moment at Ground Zero. The vast black crater, like a gaping void, seemed to sum up all the evil that touches our world. You could feel the pain and the loss experienced there. The destruction, not only of buildings, but of life itself. But just as that despair threatens to almost overwhelm you, your eyes are drawn upwards to a large, grey, iron cross. The cross itself was made of girders, iron girders, but not welded or fabricated to look like a cross, but taken out of the ground. One of the last pieces to be taken from that rubble. A last piece in the shape of a cross. And the workers hoisted it up for all to see above that scene of devastation. And all we could do was simply bow our heads in recognition of all that meant. For as we looked from the devastation, from the horror, from that expression of evil, as we looked from that up to the cross, it seemed so appropriate, so right. Somehow it belonged there. And somehow, for me, since then, the message of Good Friday has become all that clearer. The Australian poet Andrew Lansdowne has a poem simply entitled Golgotha. 
Finally, one arrives at the place of the skull because there is nowhere else to go. And there before the face of bone, one pauses in despair. The culmination of evil is displayed before one's eyes. Man's heart conspired with the devil and cared little for disguise. So as we come this night and look upon the cross, you pause in despair. You can look at the cross and you are caught by the needless, innocent suffering. Just as we are caught so many times in life when faced with pain and cruelty and death itself. We cannot but feel that when in this last year we have watched the horrendous situation in Ukraine. When we have witnessed what happened to the Israelis and what is now happening in Gaza. Innocent suffering, needless pain and sorrow. Desmond Tutu, during the worst atrocities of apartheid in South Africa, talked about believing by the skin of his teeth. And I doubt if there's a minister or priest who has not walked away from the many situations that we have been in, not walked away and cried, my God, why? Echoing the words of Jesus from the cross. And at times, the cross can appear to be the last word in the futility of human suffering. And there are those who see no further. There are those who look at the cross and see only the pain and the suffering and the horrendous thing that happened to Jesus, who was an innocent young man. And why could God let that happen? Who look at the cross and cannot see past the evil and the suffering and the pain. The cross for them is the proof that innocence is trampled underfoot by the raw power of evil. Yet the cross above that place of devastation in ground zero, indeed above all places of innocent suffering, speaks another word, a word not of despair, but of hope for the cross. And nothing but the cross proves to us that God was in Christ. And God was in Christ bearing our griefs, carrying our sorrows. And God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Just as that cross was in the midst of that destruction, so the cross speaks to us of God in the very midst of suffering. God in the midst of pain. God in the midst of evil and despair. So often we are asked, where is God in all this? The cross proves to us that God is right there in the midst, bringing comfort, bringing solace, Right across the road 
from ground zero. It was the Anglican Church. And although it was but a few yards, metres away, not a single pane of glass was broken in the midst of it all. And that place became a sanctuary for those who were suffering. It remained open night and day, serving food, food, washing feet, comforting, counselling, grieving, crying with them. And as one came in and asked, in ridicule, where is God in all this? The priest said, look around. God is here. God is here working through all, working to bring comfort, to bring solace, to bring help, to dry our tears, and to cry alongside us. That's why it was not just appropriate that the cross should be lifted high, high above and over ground zero, but absolutely necessary, necessary in proclaiming what our faith Emmanuel, we say at Christmas time, God with us. It is also written in blood in a place called Golgotha, where Christ was crucified and the love of God was shown beyond belief and beyond expression the love of God to each and every one of us. Let us pray. Father, as we look at the cross, as we look at the innocent suffering and pain, may we see also your love reaching out to us offering forgiveness and offering that way back to yourself. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn is 374, From Heaven You Came.
Let us pray. Father God, never more than on this day do we praise and thank you for your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, our Lord. All that he was, all that he said, and all that he did, but especially we give you thanks for his death on Calvary, his pain, his suffering, his agony and his death. Broken for us, we know that you, O God, are present with us in the deepest darkness. So especially this night, we pray for humanity. Humanity in all its brokenness, Humanity in its desperate despair. We pray for the many who bear the burden of guilt and sin without any faith or in the knowledge of a loving Saviour. We pray for many who this night may feel forsaken by old friends, wounded by loved ones, and even deserted by God himself. We pray for those who cry out in despair, my God, my God, why? We pray for the many who have been wrongly arrested, those who have been falsely accused, and those who are incarcerated in prisons, subjected to abuse. We pray for the many who are suffering for the sake of the gospel, sometimes scorned by family and their community and persecuted by their enemies. And we pray, as always, for those who are ill at this time, especially those who are dying in pain, And we remember those who have no friend and no loved one to be by their side in their hour of need. And we pray for those who are sitting by bedsides, feeling helpless. May they know of your love, of your friendship, of your compassion and your healing touch. And we pray for all of us, those here tonight who have secret burdens, perhaps long-standing wounds, who remember past wrongs. We look to you, Christ our living Saviour, for encouragement, for help, and most of all, forgiveness. Holy God, loving Saviour, gather us up into the amazing grace and glory that we have seen in Christ Jesus, the crucified one, and hear us as together we pray the words taught to us by him, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. I've always said that you cannot really appreciate the hallelujahs of the Easter morning until you have walked along that road of this week, until you have been with the pain and the sorrow. Only then does the hallelujahs of the Easter morning 
really have any meaning. We go still in sadness and despair, but we know that we look forward to the joy that is to come. Our closing hymn is 380, There is a Green Hill Far Away. By faith in the one who was despised and rejected. Take courage to live for the truth he taught and showed us. Should you fail and fall, let his grace pick you up. Tend your wounds and set you on the road again. The costly grace of Christ shall redeem you. The priceless love of God shall support you. The precious fellowship of the Spirit shall encourage you. Now and evermore.